So when you, when you think about the, the world of chronic pain, the non-surgical world. Oh, is that better? Yeah. Okay, when you think about the world of the non-surgical world of chronic pain, the standard in pain psychology has been cognitive behavioral therapy for the last 20, 30 years. And what we're finding is that there's hundreds of studies showing effectiveness of standard cognitive behavioral therapy, but the effectiveness is extremely limited. In fact, cognitive behavioral therapists for chronic pain don't talk about reducing pain because it doesn't seem to be a feasible goal. So they actively encourage patients not to, not that we're not gonna help reduce your pain, we're gonna help you function better, which is fine. Have you been in chronic pain ever? Have you had pain? I have. And when you talk to people in chronic pain, they don't, they're fine, they're happy to be more functional. But what they want is to be out of chronic pain because it overtakes their whole life, every day, every minute, every hour. And the same is true for this low back pain, same is true for fibromyalgia. The effects are extremely limited on actually reducing pain. And then I've been teaching mindfulness for 20 years. I think everyone should learn mindfulness. What are the, what's the effect of mindfulness on chronic pain? The same, it's no better than CBT. And the same is true for ACT and all the other types of therapies that we've come up with so far. And we believe that there's a particular reason for that. And we, just pu we published a paper this year in Psychosomatic Medicine, my colleague Mark Limley and I. And we believe that when you have a lack of a specific diagnosis, then you have a ceiling effect. So the thing is, what's the cause of pain? So all people in the chronic pain world say, well, what is chronic pain? Well, it's, it's brain and it's body and it's both. It's always the same, it's always both. And we treat all pain the same. It doesn't matter, there's no distinction. But are we, do we really think that treating the pain of metastatic bone cancer is the same as treating the pain of migraine headaches? that may come and go and may go away for a year or five years and then come back? Do we really think that the hot joints of rheumatoid arthritis with inflammation and swelling is the same as fibromyalgia where there's pain all over, but the pain shifts from one part of the body to the other day by day or minute by minute, and there's no demonstrable disorder in the body that we can find? Do we really think that's the same? And so, that's what we've been wondering, and that's what we've been trying to figure out. And then when you take the methods for helping, when you take the methods for helping people, if the methods are geared toward coping, it's different than methods that are geared toward relieving pain. And if that's possible, might not that be better? And I'm gonna show you data from two studies that we've done in the last couple years uh, that point to this. And then finally, uh, standard, standard therapies it tend to ignore emotions. They tend to focus on cognitions. And it turns out that there's a ton of data suggesting that emotions are connected to pain. Now, I feel like I'm losing you guys totally now because I'm talking to <laughs> surgeons about emotions, but see if you can stick with me for a moment. So we came up with the idea of central sensitization. Okay, well, there's a that's maybe the brain is really important. And what's the problem with sen the concept of central sensitization from my point of view, the problem with the concept of central sensitization, it's seen as a static problem. Your brain is sensitized, so it's like damage, it's broken. It's always gonna be in pain, and pain therefore is incurable. It's incurable. And when people have, you guys are neurosurgeons, when people have strokes, they have large parts potentially of their brain that dies, and what happens? They get better most of the time. They get better, their brain rewires, they learn to work around it somehow. They can regain, not all of them, but they can regain function in areas that were previously dead. And here we're saying that people with pain have damage in the brain that will never heal, or that they can never work around, or they can never rewire. The brain is neuroplastic. And so it, that doesn't make sense to me. It's the same with TBI, but that's a slightly different topic. And so what we've learned in the last, what I've learned in the last few years is the concept of predictive coding. What's predictive coding? Uh, last summer, <clears throat> my uh, wife 
woke up really early before the sun came up, and she has the same breakfast every day. Yogurt, granola, sliced apple. Every day, same thing. <coughs> so this day, she woke up early, she's doing her thing, and she comes up to the bedroom, and I'm still zoned out, it's dark, and she has an extra slice of, sli extra slice of apple. And she says, here, and I can't see it. So I open my mouth, and she puts it in, and I bite down on it, and I have this strong, immediate sense of disgust. And my first thought is, why is my wife trying to poison me? Well, there's a lot of reason why she would want to poison me, so that would, but why was she trying to poison me today? That's what I was wondering. Like, what did I do today that was so bad? Why did I have that extreme sense of disgust at this apple? Turned out it was a peach that day. My brain was expecting apple. And when you get, when you're expecting an apple, you have this, this whole circuitry of your brain is predicting what you should experience. And a peach, this was a good peach. I love peaches. It's my favorite fruit. It was sweet, but it wasn't as crunchy as an apple. Do you see what I mean? And so when I got the, the, the softness of the peach, my brain turned that to must be rotten and gave me the strong sense of disgust. <clears throat> so our brains predict what we should feel, and they create it. How do you see? You've all seen this before. Can you take a look at it now with fresh eyes, OK? How many women do you see? Two. two? Everybody see two women? Are you with me? No? Who, who's having, uh, who needs help? So there's a, a, I won't say older, but an experienced woman with her chin down here and her nose here and her eye here, right? And there's a younger woman with her ear here, her chin here, and her eyelash over here. OK, you with me? OK, so can you see both at the same time? Probably not. It's a little bit hard to do that. Can you switch back and forth? How do you, how do you change the vision that your brain is constructing? Because we see with our uh, uh, visual cortex, obviously, not with our eyes. How do you change it from one to the other? You can change it, right? How do you do that? Change your state of expectation. You change your focus. You change what you're paying attention to. These are neural circuits that turn on and off. The brain works by neural circuits. How do we walk? How do we talk? How do we smile? How do we gesture? These are all neural circuits that we've learned over the years. And you can change your focus. You can change what neural circuit is activated by changing your focus. What if pain is a neural circuit? What if some forms of pain are neural circuits that turn on and off? That you can shift, you can turn them on and off by shifting your focus. That's the thesis. That's, the, what I, that's what our work is. And the brain can create what's not there. So how many police officers are on this hot runs, and they get to the scene of the whatever, and they see a gun? How do we know? You know, our brains construct what we see based on what we expect to see. These guys and women are in really difficult position, and their brain can so easily see things that aren't there. Are you with me? Am I making sense? And so, so that's what predictive coding is. And predictive coding is how we, how we determine what we feel. And predictive coding is our brain making a decision whether to feel pain or not in a given circumstance, in a given day, in a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And so if a kid falls on the playground, if his predictive coding is when you fall, your mother's going to come running and make sure you're OK, or the predictive coding is you fall and you get up and you're OK. And that determines whether the kid who falls whether his or her little brain, well, brain, <laughs> decides, makes a judgment whether to activate pain or not. When I had back pain several years ago, it hurt every time I bent over. And it turned out there was nothing wrong with my back. It turned out my brain was activating pain when I bent over as a conditioned response. As predict, it was predicting pain. It was generating pain. And fixing that, when, when that's the diagnosis, fixing that is often easy because I decided to tell my brain, this is how stupid is that, to tell my brain to correct the misperception. Every time I bent over, I told my brain, I'm fine, it's OK. And within a month, pain went away. Not, not I coped with it better, pain went away. 
And that's the data that I'm going to show you on back pain in a minute. So how do I explain this to patients? This guy shot a nail in his hand by mistake. How much pain did he have? None. Zero. He's Canadian, exactly. <laughs> but he was alone at a construction site. His brain decided it's better to drive to the hospital than be in pain alone. So our brains, if you evolved or designed, depending on how you think of it, if you're running from a lion across the savannah and you break your ankle, do you want pain then? Yes, because you're, I'm, I'm sorry, if you're running, I, I screwed up, you were right. If you're running, if you're trying to catch a deer and you're running across the savannah and you break an ankle, do you want pain? Answer, yes. Because if you don't get severe pain, then you'll keep running and you'll ruin your ankle and you'll never reproduce. It's not good for your gene pool. So. But the pain has to be severe enough to make you stop running. And what's causing that pain? It's the brain activating pain, because not all injuries cause pain. Your brain has to decide to activate pain in that situation. Now, if you're running from a lion and you break your ankle, do you want pain? Answer, no, because you will die. So that's what happened to this guy. His brain interpreted this as a lion situation, gave him no pain. This guy has a nail through his boot at a construction site. He screams in pain. They rush him to the hospital. They give him IV pain medication when he gets there because his pain is so severe. Where's the nail? Directly between his toes. There's no injury at all. His brain manufactured this pain in, in the absence of any tissue damage. And now how common is it that our brain activates pain in the absence of any tissue damage? I'm going to show you data on that that I believe suggests that it's extremely common. And so when you give someone any, and this pain is real. All pain is real. And when you give someone a, an emotional injury and do fMRI of the brain, and then you give them a physical injury and do fMRI of the brain, it's, the images are the same. Because, emotion, because the danger salience network of the brain activates pain. And it can activate pain in relation to a physical injury, or it can activate pain in relation to an emotional injury. So if your boss is micromanaging you, if your spouse is cheating, if your kids are doing drugs, that can cause physical pain because it's activating the exact same danger signal that an injury would. That's how our brains are constructed. Are you with me? So this guy it was a doctor I met a few years ago. He's in the Vietnam War as a young man, a long time ago. And he's, one day his company got ambushed. He had shrapnel wound to his leg, had a lot of pain, gets medevaced out. So he comes, he has a lot of pain. His danger signal is activating pain. And due to the injury, what happens to his injury? It heals, because all injuries heal. And, he, and his danger signal gets turned off by his brain. He's fine. He's pain free. 20 years later, he's walking down the street. He gets startled by the sound of a helicopter. And what happens? He gets the exact same pain in his leg that he had 20 years earlier. His brain learned pain as a neural circuit. <laughs> It remembered it, and then it activated it at the sound of a helicopter. When we see patients with pain that are activated by, by a light, by a sound, by a smell, by cold, by, by the weather, by bending, these are triggering responses that are triggering the brain to activate pain, and they may have nothing to do with a structural problem. So all pain is generated by the brain. All pain is real. And whether there's tissue damage or not is our job, from my point of view, to decide. So the model that I use to explain to people is that this danger alarm mechanism is a neural circuit that activates pain and a whole variety of other symptoms that obviously you'll see in patients with chronic pain that causes fear and worry and focus. And that fear and worry and focus is what drives the chronicity of the pain. And this is what determines why pain, typically chronic pain over time, spreads. It gets worse. And it particularly gets worse when it's misdiagnosed, from my point of view, if it's misdiagnosed as a structural problem. Because when you show somebody that MRI, and they come in and they, you say, what's their problem? And they say, I've got 10 bulging discs. They don't say I have back pain. They say, I've got bulging discs. What does that do to the sphere worry focus mechanism? It aggravates it which makes their pain worse. And sensitization occurs from, from a whole variety of things in their past, particularly early life trauma that, that sensitizes this danger signal to be more hypervigilant, more overactive, so that later life stress can activate it 
and create symptoms. So we talked about, we, uh, so what if we had a test that would determine if someone has a structural pain or a, a neural circuit pain? Would that be nice? Well, we have that test for epilepsy. So seizures, are you familiar with this? You must be, you're a neurosurgeon, sorry. So see, so this, somebody came up with this brilliant idea of 24-hour video monitoring. And when you take people who are shaking on the ground and you do an EEG, roughly 40 to 60% have completely normal EEGs at the time of the, of the epilepsy or the seizure or the attack. And 40 to 60% have abnormal EEGs. So we have a test. And how do we treat people with epilepsy? We give them medications. Sometimes we operate on their brains. You guys do that? S seizure surgery? Yeah. So we can do extremely invasive procedures because this is a medical diagnosis that needs medical care. But what happens when the EEG is normal? How do we treat them? We don't give them medications. We don't operate on them. We give them psychological treatment because they don't have a physical problem. It's a simple test. Some patients admittedly have combinations of the two, and that certainly can happen. What percentage of patients with head pain have structural problems in their brain, or their head, or their scalp, or their sinuses? Very few. What percentage of patients with fibromyalgia have disease in their body? Almost none. Irritable bowel, chronic pelvic pain, chronic abdominal pain. Now here's the big one. This is a question. What percentage of people with chronic back and neck pain have a structural problem? I'm going to show you some data on that, but we don't have good data. Richard, the only, it's hard to find good data on this, and if someone has good data, please, please help me with that. But Richard Deo suggested that approximately 85% of people don't have a clearly identifiable structural problem, but again, it depends on your interpretation and your interpretation of these MRI findings. So almost any symptom can be caused by a neural circuit in the absence of no susceptive input, and almost any symptom can be structural. It's our job. So this is what the data I showed you. This is the table I use. I show that to all my patients. 80% of 50-year-olds, 60% of 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds is 70 and nine, almost 90%. Is back pain contagious? It's a great, interesting study from West Germany. Uh, East Germany, where when fall the Berlin Wall, East German back pain was low, and then it rose to the level. The, the authors conclude that back pain is a communicable disorder. Some countries in the world, it's very rare for a, doc, a patient to go to a doctor for back pain. Some places in the world, like here, it's extremely common to go to the doctor for back pain, but people's backs are the same all over the world. What is the factor? Are you familiar with this data? It's old data, hasn't been reproduced, but it's fascinating because these people who all needed back surgery, 95% of these people with no risk factors had successful back surgery. With three or more risk factors, only 15% had successful back surgery. What's the risk factor? Childhood trauma. Sensitization of the brain when you, and there's good data, are you familiar with Chad Brummett from University of Michigan? Chad Brummett, he's a, a, I don't know if he's, I think he's a surgeon, could be a PM&R guy. But he's, he's, he's evaluated people pre-op for the fibromyalgia phenotype, people with chronic pain, people with moving pain, people with anxiety and depression. And those people have higher opiate use, higher length of stay, less successful surgery, and knee surgery, hip surgery, and, and, I'm, and obviously, with spine surgery. So this is a lady I saw several years ago. She was scheduled for surgery. This is her findings, kind of like the findings in my neck, which I didn't bring my MRI, but kind of like that. She was pain-free in, in three weeks. So how do we <clears throat> diagnose people? So firstly, it's really not a clearly, is there, when you present a case with neurological findings, I'm backing off. It's like, oh, neurological findings, that's something wrong. When you present a case with fracture, tumor, infection, I'm like, OK, refer to somebody. But if routine testing isn't showing a clearly identifiable structural problem, what tests can we use, like the 24-hour video EEG, that can rule in a neural circuit problem? And that's what I've been doing for the last several years. How can we rule in a neural circuit problem? And the answer is, in my view, is by talking to people and looking in detail for the evidence of a neural, of a neural circuit. 
And so what is that? Well, pain begins with no physical precipitation. I woke up with it. That's a clue that it's your brain doing it. The, the injury is healed, but the pain persists. Uh, the pattern is symmetric. Now, you can certainly have symmetric problems if your cord is damaged, if you have diabetic neuropathy. But what I've found is that in the absence of those findings, symmetric patterns, these mirror images, is often the brain. Uh, the whole side of the body. Well, what nerve goes to the whole side of the body? The whole arm. It's not a nerve root distribution. So these are simple things that you guys know and symptoms that occur in many different parts of the body. The other thing that I find is the quality. When you see this tingling, burning, hot, cold, these are classic symptoms from my point of view of neural circuit problems, okay? Secondly, inconsistent. It shifts from one part of the body to the other. So sometimes the pain's in the mid-back and sometimes it's in the lower back. So if your arm is broken, the pain doesn't move from one place to the other. When you ask these simple questions, and maybe you're doing that, I don't know, but if you're listening to those answers, this will give you clues to the fact that the brain is turning on one neural circuit and turning off another neural circuit. A lot of times we see patient the time of the day. Oh, it's better in the morning, better in the afternoon, worse in the evening. You think about them when there's stress. I go on vacation, the pain goes away. So I'm looking for those clues. I had a lady with typing pain, Monday through Friday, worse, 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 worse. Sounds structural, because it was completely related to typing. And I asked her, do you have the pain any other time of day? And she says, yes, yeah, Sunday evening. So as soon as she tells me that, that's my Sherlock Holmes moment, where that's the diagnosis. I don't care about anything else, because there's nothing structural we could find. When the pain occurs when you're anticipating going to work, to me, that's the clue that's saying this is a neural circuit. That lady's fine now, because we made a clear and accurate diagnosis, OK? And then you get a, you know, I, I had Reiki, or I had an herb, and I had acupuncture. It just went away for a day, or a minute, or an hour, or a week. That's a sign that the brain is turning it off as a placebo effect. And then finally, this triggering phenomenon. And, I, and I'm going to describe how we can work with that. Because when you're having triggering phenomenon, uh, a light touch causes, this is classic for fibromyalgia. And what I'm doing in my office is I'm pushing on the back or the, where the pain is. And I'm saying, if I push here, does it hurt? OK? And they say, yeah, it's really tender. You push here and it hurts. So that sounds like a structural problem. So then what I'm doing is I'm saying, OK, I'm going to put my hand on your back at the paraspinal level. And I'm not going to push, but I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine that I'm pushing right now. What happens? And most of the time, the person will say, that hurts when I imagine pushing on it. Because the brain is activating that neural circuit by imagining because when you imagine seeing a tree, it's the same part of your brain lights up as when you actually see a tree. And so then I'm working with that. To so then I'm saying, OK, let me, if you imagine, if imagining makes the pain worse, then to me, that's a neural circuit. And so I'm, I'm getting a signal that I have to stop. And so let me just show you two things. One is I say to every patient, if anyone says it's all in your head, they're either cruel or ignorant or both. And patients completely buy into that, because we're treating them with compassion and with love, and we're telling them that these are neural circuits. And so let me just skip over the motion study. We just completed a study at University of Colorado Boulder of back pain. Age, average age 41, 10 years of back pain. I, ex I evaluated 45 patients. Of the 45, from my point of view, based on the criteria I just gave you, do you know how many I thought had something wrong with their back? Zero. Now, oh, maybe I'm crazy. But one patient had a history of ankylosing spondylitis. Turned out it was a misdiagnosis. He didn't have it. <clears throat> one patient had a, a, a disc with radiculopathy, but that had passed. And now her pain was not due to that. And so we treated those people with uh, a uh, reducing pain and fear and worry about the pain. And in one month, 75% were pain-free. In one month, 75% of those patients were pain-free in a randomized, controlled trial. And, and follow-up, the pain has stayed low. And so 
what I'm doing basically is doing an assessment to explain, to validate symptoms, to be compassionate, to explain pain, to look for evidence of predictive coding, uh, examine them, review their images, give them hope, optimism, and start a treatment plan which helps to reduce the fear and the pain and the worry, which actually reduces the pain because the neural circuits are changeable. And I think I better stop, correct? Correct. So um, those who need to leave, leave, feel free to ask some questions for a bit. This is, I don't know if you just heard what Howard said. I mean, chronic pain is curable. The neuroscience has given the answer. You literally can redirect the brain to rewire a different way, whatever, however terminology you want to use it. And you know, we've been, again, Howard is my mentor. We've been seeing this for about at least 10 years, consistently seeing people go to pain-free. I have my approach. He has his approach. I know Mark has his approach. The approach doesn't matter. The key issue is compassion, listening, helping the people feel safe, which I think changes the body's chemistry to play hormones as opposed to stress hormones, which changes the sensitivity of the nervous system. But I mean, that's a theory. But, this, but the key issue here is chronic pain is curable. And it even gets to the point where I had over 100 patients actually cancel their surgeries on structural problems because the pain still disappeared. In other words, it doesn't really matter where the source of the pain comes from. So. Um, Quick questions to Howard. Any comments? Mark? Yeah, Howard, you gave the example of the physician who was triggered from Vietnam, created by the helicopter. That, you know, the psychiatric tolerance is PTSD. You showed the own data that childhood trauma and outcomes of surgery, again, chronic post traumatic stress disorder. Uh, these all live in the body, not necessarily the brain. I would say that I like to think about people in terms of states. So the, uh, the remembrance of pain, the unlearning of pain, or the states, the post are always there, and the whole management. I just wanted to get your ideas about the idea of PTSD, state specific, and again, I'm I'm the, the idea of the brain. The brain is processing it, but these states are always there. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by states, and I'm not sure exactly what you mean by the pain lives in the body, and so we could discuss that. Uh, PTSD is a word, you know. It's 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 all it's all PTSD is one way to look at it, no question about it. Another way to look at it is PTSD is a label that people get, which imply and can imply to a lot of people that they're damaged, they're broken, and they can never get better. So. The way I like to think of it is predictive coding, where, where we're conditioned through our whole life experiences to have experiences in the moment that are related to that, related to input coming in from the external environment and input coming in from our body and input coming in from our past and our brain and our memory. And you put all that together and then moment by moment, these states, the brain is deciding to uh, create pain or not create pain, to create anxiety or not create anxiety. And patients that I see, they have pain, the pain goes away, and then they get anxious. The anxiety goes away, and then they get pain in a different area. So these state, these different symptoms of neural circuits are interchangeable, and, and they cross over between physical states and, quote, psychological states. Tim? Do you think chiropractic and or acupuncture are placebo? Yes. Well, uh, acupuncture has been shown to be a placebo based on studies when you compare sham versus real acupuncture. And there's nothing against placebo. That's what I do. Placebo medicine is if you have a neural circuit problem, all you need is a good placebo. So I'm not against it. If you go to John of God in the jungles of Brazil and you get healed, hallelujah. I'm all for it. So I'm not denigrating those. I'm just saying that the action, the activity is in the brain. Chiropractic can certainly fix a, an alignment problem if there's something off. But if the brain is causing that alignment problem, it's just going to come back because you haven't got to the underlying mechanism. But I mean, I, I think placebo, we're trying to come up with a different term for it because I mean, I think what this entire process is as far as compassion, listening, helping people feel safe, and providing some structure is simply um, connecting to your own capacity to heal. That to me is placebo, which is the most powerful drug that exists, is your own capacity to heal. 
And placebo is a great, it is the, it is the response we want. I just want a different name for it because in orthopedics it's implied as well, the pain's not really there. But, you, but our evolutionary wise, we're designed to heal. And if you can connect people to, to their own capacity to heal, it works. The lecture I gave in London where Howard and I were at the same conference, and it turns out that everything works in chronic pain a little bit, nothing works in isolation. So acupuncture could be 10, 15%, sleep could be 20%, stress could be 30%. So it's this additive effect that solves chronic pain. All right, thank you very much. And uh, feel free to stick around and ask some questions to Howard afterwards. T uh, Thursday evening, six o'clock in Bellevue. Many of you have the uh, invitation to the Puget Sound Spine Society. If you don't ask, get a hold of me or get a hold of my staff. But Howard will be giving a more detailed presentation of the data you just heard. But I don't know if you saw that data. He just presented at a national conference. And 75% of people were pain-free within a month, and it was sustained. No surgeries, that's a big deal. Thank you very much.